let me ask those of you watching us today, how does it feel to spend a large part of your life serving others, providing others in need with vital services, and then in later years discovering that you have become disabled and need service? How does it feel to know at an early age that you're gay, but be growing up in a small, very deeply conservative town in Missouri? How does it feel to join a religious community searching for some higher sense of values in life and then discover some unpleasant or even contradictory things in that religious community? These are some of the questions we're going to explore today with my guest, Ed Young. Ed, thank you for being with us today. It's my pleasure. How did that feel living in a town where the social segregation was fairly strong? It was um, an interesting experience of not fitting in. So at an early age, you were what we sometimes call a marginal man? I think, yes. Mm -hmm. In in school, I felt that I was um, not really accepted as a Catholic. And if I went into the eastern part of the county, the first question I would be asked or the first statement to me would be, you're a Catholic, right? So it felt a little bit as if you were neither fish nor fowl? Right. At first, I, I escaped to college. Uh, as soon as I graduated from high school, it was, uh, okay, sign this, sign this diploma, I'm out of here. Um, and I went to Missouri U at Columbia, which also at that time we had to have permission from our pastor to go to a school that was, a college that was not Catholic. Mm -hmm. And did you stay at Missouri U for four years? No, I, I stayed there for one year because basically what I ran into was not something I expected and that was the um, um, social shock of being in a school where there were so many different values from the society that I grew up in. Um, there was a commonality in the fact that the, um, the campus was uh, very homophobic. Uh, there was a young man who was found to be gay and was beaten to death while I was there. Um, I, my roommate was an African American from Kansas City and the white people wouldn't talk to me, the black people wouldn't talk to him. Be, you know, it was the it was the days of Selma and and the uh, civil rights movement, and um, we were both just sort of um, ostracized. And this was around together. 1961, 64, 64, 64 right 65. in through there. Mm -hmm. So you then left Missouri. I I left Missouri U, and uh, transferred to St. Benedict's College in Atchison, Kansas which is a, a co four-year college that is run by um, monks from the Benedictine Order, the Order okay. of St. Benedict. So in this case, the name is a very accurate right. reflection. Mm -hmm. Did you graduate from St. Benedict? I did. I graduated and, from there. And your next step? Well, I moved, um, well, I was part of the monastery by that point. Um, I had entered the monastery in 66, I guess it was. and. Um, and lived there uh, until the early 70s, early mid 70s. Um, and I finished my degree in theology uh, at, the, at the monastery. At the monastery, at, the, at St. Benedict's, it was called then. Now it's called Benedictine College. Now, for those who are not familiar with various categories within the Roman Catholic world, did this mean that you were, in effect, becoming a priest? No, I, was, uh, I never wanted to be a priest. I did want to be a monk, and there is a difference, a subtle difference. The there. difference being? The difference being that everybody who was a monk in the monastery was that, a monk. They lived, wanted to live a monastic life, live according to the Benedictine rule, but some of them would choose to be ordained priests so that they could say mass and administer sacraments and those kinds of things, uh, which they did. The problem is that over the centuries, um, the uh, the ones who were considered the real monks, if you want, um, were 
supported by canon law in the sense that they took solemn vows and they couldn't um, couldn't inter inherit property or own anything, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, there developed over the years a two-tiered system. So there were pre monks who were priests, and they were higher up. The um, other group of monks who were not ordained were considered sort of a lower caste. And that was disturbing to me. And that did not sit well with you, clearly. No, it didn't. And, and also, um, uh, eventually, Rome got the idea that maybe what should be uh, instituted was, or reinstituted, was the uh, the role of choir monk, which was what Rome called it, which meant that um, you could be not ordained, but still have solemn vows. Solemn vows let you vote for things in the community, like who's going to be the next abbot and that kind of thing. If you didn't have solemn vows, you had no vote. Mm -hmm. So you did take the solemn vows? No, I had gone up to the point where I was uh, finishing my temporary vows and I was wanting to take solemn vows, but um, the abbot decided that I had no future in the community and he um, kindly asked me to leave. After you had been there how long? Six, seven years, eight Six years. Six or seven whatever. years, mm -hmm. and he then what, gave you a 30 days? No, he gave me till that afternoon. <laughs> so he gave you one day to leave? Yeah, a couple hours. Now, I'd was say. he aware that you were gay? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. I, was, I was upfront about that, you know. I could be gay and be celibate, which was what was required, or I could be straight and be celibate. The idea was being celibate, and so, um, it didn't matter to me if, you know, I knew that that was part of the life. And, um, but the homophobia, you know, the fear was um, something that I, I found confusing. At so least. you found a real homophobia in the monastery? Right. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that those in the monastery were supposed to be leading a life of contemplation, of prayer, and equality. Well, that's the, uh, I think, the public image. The fact is we ran a four-year college and most of, the, most of the monks who were involved in the college were just like any other group of professors, you know. Um, the egos ran high. So when you left the monastery, what was your next step? I, um, I moved eventually to Kansas City and got a job in a law firm as a records clerk. I worked there for a year or so and was asked to be a paralegal. I worked in antitrust legislation, or litigation rather. And, um, and then I was feeling again this idea of, or this sense of being a second class citizen because I was not an attorney. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll prove you all wrong. I'll go to law school. And you did? And I did, and I graduated in, what was it, 79, 80, I guess it was. From what law school? University of Missouri at Kansas City. Okay. And took the bar, passed the bar the first time, and then I began working as a staff attorney at Mid-America Regional Council, which was the regional planning commission for the Kansas City area. And you stayed there how long? I stayed there until, um, our friend Mr. Reagan cut our budget, slashed the budget. Uh -huh. And so it was in the early 80s um, that I was let go along with others who were higher paid folks in the agency. Well, eventually I, um, uh, a friend of mine called me with whom I had worked uh, at the planning commission and he was involved in a um, uh, financial planning organization and he asked me if I wanted to come to work with them, and I did. And, and I worked at that for about five years or so, became a regional vice president, yada, yada, um, and um, was uh, uh, pretty violently mugged one night on the way home from an appointment and um, became pretty much um, unable to, to go out. Um, and 
my income depended on my being able to go out, you know. So how did you deal so, with that dilemma? Well, I, I called my parents and I told them what had happened and uh, asked them if, they, if I could move home. And I called them because I wasn't sure at that point that they wanted me to come home because I had always felt that, because they knew that I was gay too, and um, I always felt like I was an embarrassment to them. What I found out later in life, uh, before my mother passed away, she and I had a long talk and, and uh, she said to me that there was only one thing she had ever wanted for me and that was that I'd be happy. And if it hadn't been for my Buddhist practice by that point, um, I would have thought she was lying to me. But I realized that she was telling me the truth. Her understanding of what an older gay man's life would be like was a pretty miserable pic picture. And she didn't want that for me. And, um, but when she said, I want you to be happy, um, what, what my first thought was, was, you know, that's the message of the Buddha, uh, that we be happy. By this point, you had already moved into being a Buddhist. Right, I had. And, and that journey began um, really basically when I was in the monastery. Because uh, of some alienation you began to feel from Roman Catholicism? No, it wasn't alienation at all at that point. It was more um, a sense of seeking um, and finding in some mystics in their writings, uh, Christian mystics, especially the Rhineland mystics. Um, one of them had said at one point that um, in every human being, there is a place where God knows us better than we know ourselves. And at that place, God and the person are one. And I thought, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, that struck a chord with that you. That struck a chord. Mm -hmm. And the other was uh, uh, my favorite Christian theologian, Teilhard de Chardin, who was a French Jesuit and an anthropologist. And he studied the development of consciousness, of the brain, basically. Um, and he had a theory of uh, that, that said the more complex an organism becomes, uh, let me go back, there was consciousness in everything, which made a lot of sense to me. But the more complex an organism became, the more obvious that consciousness could be measured, or could be seen or experienced. And he said what made human mind was when it, the mind developed to a point where it could be reflective and say I. And at that point, we could see ourselves outside of relationship with all of nature, with other people. And that outside of relationship business for him was what he called sin. And that made a lot of sense to me too. You know, it wasn't you're going to hell for this reason or that reason or something else, you know, which to me was all a control mechanism and um, never made any sense at all. Uh, but the idea that an individual felt that he or she could detach themselves from the rest of humanity or the rest of people or their community? That that was wrong. Because, in fact, it was more um, a sense of, I don't want to say wrong, because that implies um, a morality kind of judgment. It was an illusion. Because, in fact, we really are connected. We're all from the same stardust, if you want. you know. Um, and there is a connection that we have with each other. I mean, even that idea that the Christian mystics talked about, about this place uh, where God knows us better than we know ourselves, I have that, you have that. If we both have it, then we're both one. I see. But the place to which you went, in addition to spiritually moving into Buddhism, <clears throat> you geographically went back to Perryville. I did move back to Perryville. And how and long did you stay there? I stayed there for five years. And I think the major thing that I experienced when I was back there 
was the fact that um, I felt appreciated by my parents, um, by my father more than my mom. Mom, mom and I had a rough, a rough time um, because she always feared that I was going to go to hell. Um, and, uh, and at that time, I really thought that I was her major embarrassment. She once called and told me I was going to adopt a uh, young mulatto kid who was in foster care. And um, she said, I lived in Kansas City at the time, and she said, well, if you adopt, it'll get into the papers in Kansas City and other people who live in Perryville, who are from Perryville, rather, and who live in Kansas City will find out that you're gay. And if it gets back to Perryville, it'll ruin your father's business. My father was an undertaker. You know, what, is everybody going to drop dead? That sounds good for business, you know? So I never did understand her logic. After five years in Perryville, you left? I left Perryville. Okay. I had, by this point, um, made some friends with the uh, priests who manned the parish, the Catholic parish in my hometown, um, Vincentians, Congregation of the Mission, uh, their, their official title. And um, they're the same group that uh, founded DePaul University. Um, and they had been in Perryville since uh, the early 1800s, from 1816, in fact. Uh, next year is the 200th anniversary of their, of their being in this country. And um, um, they, I never really felt comfortable about, around them as a kid, but the guys who were in the parish at this point, in, when I moved back to Perryville, were a good bunch of people. And um, they said, why don't you come and uh, be a part of, of our community? So I did. I, I joined the Vincentians. I spent a year in St. Louis setting up an AIDS hospice. I um, spent some time in Philadelphia and Brooklyn and then moved to Denver to complete uh, or to work on a uh, master's in Hebrew scripture. What were you doing in Brooklyn? Oh, I, I worked at, a, at the old campus of St. John's University down in Brooklyn, and uh, it was a tremendous experience of, uh, you know, the direct connection with the poor, which is what um, Vincent DePaul, who founded that order, um, was known for. So you worked, helped to set up and administer an AIDS hospice, then you worked with the poor in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. okay, and after that? After that, it was back to school, you know, working uh, at the seminary in Denver um, on my master's. For how uh, long? Uh, that was just a year, because it was the final year that the, that the seminary was open. The, and after that? And then I moved here to Chicago. I was uh, first at 92nd and South Exchange, but that's where I was living but going to school at CTU, Catholic Theological Union in Hyde Park. Fabulous school. And after you finished there? After I finished there, I left the Vincentians because I had run into a homophobia and all that kind of stuff again. It was like, again. I've had enough of this. So what did you do next? You know, so I worked with uh, the homeless <laughs> up in Uptown, and, um, and then I worked, uh, I was, offered an opportunity to, to go to DePaul and work there. And um, I worked initially with, in a program that, uh, at St. Joseph's Hospital, um, which was a hospital founded by the Daughters of Charity, the sister organization with the Congregation of the Mission. Um, I worked there, and this program was for uh, young men who had had an, an incarceration history and were given uh, practical work in the hospital uh, to prepare them for work outside. After that program at St. Joseph's closed, I worked um, under a grant from the Centers for Disease Control uh, and uh, teaching cognitive skills development. And um, uh, that again was with non-traditional students, but based at the, at the university, um, with 
young men and women who had had an incarceration history or a drug problem. So again, you were serving those who had special needs. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at some point, I understand, you began to develop some special needs of your own. When did your medical problems hit you? Um, those had been developing since 1980, and I didn't know it. Uh, I was totally unaware of the fact that my liver was going south. Then how and when <laughs> did you learn that that was the case? Well, it, w it wasn't until um, uh, late in 2013 I started uh, gaining all kinds of weight. I was really uncomfortable. Um, I went to the hospital. They were doing paracentesis procedures to draw excess fluids out of my stomach cavity. and. And um, I was just miserable. Then by February of 2014, I fell and um, uh, knocked myself out on the way down. And so um, I ended up in the hospital again at St. Francis in Evanston. And um, I had uh, developed a rhabdomyostasis, uh, which is a sort of a disintegration of the muscles in my legs, which is why my legs gave out. And um, eventually, I, things just kept getting worse. Uh, my, my doctor uh, said that um, the tests that they had run when I was in the hospital showed that my liver was only operational at 15%. What in the world came after that? Well, um, he referred me to the wonderful people at the transplant clinic at Northwestern. And uh, in my first meeting with them, they put me directly in the hospital. That was in May of 2014. And four and a half months later, I had a new liver and a new kidney. And was that surgery successful? Yes. Mm -hmm. OK. But all of this medical care, what did that do to your financial situation? Oh. <laughs> it uh, eliminated it. It uh, eliminated any kind of uh, um, resources that I had. Your savings were soon gone. Yeah, they were they were gone even before all the medical stuff started because I had been unemployed for a period of three years and I was, um, you know, sort How of... How in the senior. world did you cope with this? Well, my Buddhist practice helps me with that. Um, we have a sense that um, the Buddha taught that that everybody has to deal with birth, suffering, old age, and death. Okay, so um, I've had the birth part, I've had the suffering part, I've had the uh, old age, or I'm having the old age stuff, so the only thing I have to uh, deal with when that comes along, which is no big deal, is death, because I, see, I keep telling people I'll come back, you know, I don't have to worry about that. Um, but um, the, anything that happens in our lives any obstacle that we uh, that we run into, we have a, an ability to take a look at that and see it as it really is. What what do the obstacles that that come to us really mean? They're an opportunity to grow. Every one of them is an opportunity to grow. So as you were undergoing all of this medical difficulty, considerable pain and suffering, financial deterioration as well, you didn't find yourself losing or deeply questioning your religious faith? No, not at all. It was strengthened by the fact that all of that was there because I could see what uh, fortune I had at the same time. I had tremendous support from friends, you know. Um, I had uh, I had the ability to chant with the focus that I would be 100% um, victorious no matter what that victory looked like. And you did achieve a medical victory in the sense that the doctors successfully performed the transplant, right. okay? Mm -hmm. But did Medicare, since by this point you were 65, correct? Right, oh, yeah. Did Medicare pay all these costs? Medicare paid a bunch, Medicaid paid a bunch. Um, there are still some, some costs left over, but I was um, counseled by the social worker over at Northwestern that there are several foundations that they have that have a good chunk of money uh, that I can apply for aid from 
from those foundations. You mentioned so I'm not Medicaid. Worried about you part. mentioned Medicaid. Mm -hmm. How did that come into play? Um, after I had fallen and uh, spent time at St. Francis Hospital and then later at St. Joseph's for, uh, for um, acute rehab, um, I had applied for Medicaid and because I wasn't able to work so I didn't have any income coming in from uh, from DePaul and um, I applied and you know when you, when you uh, apply successfully then they grant you retroactive yes. um, retroactively for three months so um, bottom line is it got um, it got um, I got approved back to April of 2014, which didn't cover the hospitalizations in February and March. And um, I appealed, and that appeal took a year, but I had the documentation to prove that I had submitted everything that they had required back in March, and I won the appeal. And so I was approved back to January 1st of 2014. Retroactively. Retroactive, yes. Okay. As a result of all of these experiences, okay, um, do you think that that has somehow altered the nature of your religious faith, although you say you have not lost your faith at all? No. I, I have a great appreciation for Christianity. It uh, just, Buddhism provides me something else, I think, something that I needed, which is a very practical way of seeing life and seeing my my reality and the possibility that I can change. So from Perryville, Missouri to now living in Chicago, mm -hmm. from Roman Catholic upbringing with parents of religious marriage to now finding a spiritual satisfaction in Buddhism, from law school to a life of social service, and finally being a person who receives services, you've done it all. No, I haven't done it all. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think but I do <laughs> appreciate my practice very much. It's very, very much a part of who I am. Um, I, I practice Nichiren Buddhism with the Soka Gakkai, which is a um, Japanese term for value-creating society. So my, my whole purpose anymore is to create value however I can. And I think you have not only done that in your life, but by coming to us today, you've given, I think, a real value to our viewers and listeners, and I want to thank you for doing so. Thank you.